Today we're going to continue talking about the double vertical stroke and we're going to start talking about how to do interval changes with a four mallet grip. Interval changes are an important part of four mallet playing. This lesson and the accompanying etude and exercises start pretty basic, so all of the interval changes will be small, stepwise motions. To change intervals using the Stevens technique, simply roll the inside mallet between your thumb and first finger. This outside mallet should, for the most part, stay steady and not move. With the Burton grip or cross grip, use your middle finger, ring finger, and pinky finger to change the position of the inside mallet and therefore the interval. When you're comfortable with the basic motion required to change intervals in each hand, start practicing one hand at a time using the exercise in the book. Remember from our last lesson that a double vertical stroke is when both mallets in the same hand strike the marimba at the same time. The interval changes in this exercise that we're about to do are the exact same interval changes that you need in the etude that's a part of this same lesson. You'll notice a couple things when I'm doing this. First of all, I'm changing the interval in the same way that we talked about shifts between notes in the previous lesson. In other words, I change the interval of my mallets at the soonest possible moment. So in this particular exercise, I have a full measure of rest between each measure that I play. So as soon as I've played one measure, I change my interval so that I'm prepared to play the notes in the next measure. You'll also notice that I'm still using that piston stroke that we talked about in the first lesson. That's the stroke that starts up, goes down to the bar, and comes right back up to the same starting position. I'm going to set my metronome for the lowest tempo of the tempo range for this exercise, which is quarter equals 80. And I'm going to start by practicing one hand at a time at that tempo. That beginning tempo is nice and slow so that you can just focus on your hands. You don't have to worry about going fast. That being said, I realize that pretty much every musician who's ever learned how to play an instrument wants to play faster all the time. And so it's a struggle to start slow. But I promise you from years of doing this, from years of teaching, that the musicians who are able to have the patience to start slow and make the music feel really good at a slow tempo are the ones who can eventually play it super fast, super clean, and with a lot of cool musical expression. Once you are starting to feel comfortable at quarter equals 80, then you can start nudging the tempo up. So here's what the exercise sounds like at a quarter equals 100. Before you move on to the next exercise, which is the left hand alone, start taking some of the rests 
in that first exercise out. We talked about this with the first lesson. Even though the exercise is written a very specific way in the book, there's so many infinite ways that you can vary that exercise so that you're working on what you need to work on. So for instance, in that first exercise, you play four notes and then you rest for four notes. But once you're feeling really comfortable and confident with that, you can play four notes and then you can rest for only two notes. So you're giving yourself a little bit less time for that interval change. As you get comfortable with that version of the exercise, you can do a version of the exercise where you eliminate the rest entirely. The important thing is that you're changing the exercises in a way that helps you where you're at right now with your learning. Two super important things to remember about all the exercises in this entire series. One is that I really do want you to change them in ways that help you play. You can be creative with them. Eventually you'll even be coming up with your own exercises in this series. But the important thing is not exactly what I wrote down. That's a great starting point and you should always start there. But then say to yourself, if I take out a rest, will that help push me a little bit further? Or if I add rests, will that give me a little bit more time to do this new technique that I'm working on? The second super important thing about all of the exercises in this book is that they are taken directly from the etudes that you're going to be performing. So in this particular exercise that we've been working on, you're working on the exact same interval changes that you're going to be using in the etude that's a part of this same lesson. And that is a really important point that I want to make. If you have a super difficult measure in a longer piece of music that you're learning, you can isolate that measure that's tough and find something cool in it to make an exercise out of. And then you're working on it in a different way. That'll mean that when you get to that difficult measure and that longer piece of music, you'll be super comfortable with it because you've been working on whatever is challenging about that one section of the piece. As you're thinking about these different ways that you might change the exercises and modify them, remember that the most important way is just by playing different dynamics. I want you to be sure to play the exercises in this lesson at a bunch of different dynamics, from very quiet piano dynamics the very loud forte dynamics. There's one more thing I want to mention in this lesson. It's something I'm going to be talking about in almost every lesson, and that is phrasing. We talked about phrasing a whole lot in the last lesson. And actually, in some ways, phrasing the music in this lesson is a little bit easier than it was in the last lesson. Because in the etude, that's a part of this lesson, I write a ton of dynamics. Almost every single note has a crescendo or a decrescendo written under it. So really following the printed dynamics will go a long way towards making the music come alive and sound interesting and cool and fun. But that being said, there's still a little bit of room for you to be expressive by making subtle variations in the dynamics. Most importantly, there are a lot of crescendos or diminuendos that start or end at mezzo forte or at mezzo piano. And not every single one of those mezzo fortes or mezzo pianos has to be exactly the same. So when you watch the video of me performing this etude, listen for that. Listen for how maybe one time I play mezzo forte a little bit less or a little bit more than another time. And think about why I'm doing that and how it makes the music sound and then try it on your own. Now I'm going to play the complete etude number two for you. Thanks so much for being here. See you next time.